Hello, my name is Christian. I'm a technical agile coach and author of the refactoring book, Five Lines of Code. I'm sitting here with Michael Feathers, the author of the book, Working Effectively with Legacy Code, which has helped thousands of developers since it was published in 2004. Michael, what are you up to these days? What am I up to these days? Lots of things. Um, I'm a chief architect of Globant, but I also do training and consulting independently as well. Um, yeah, it's, I think I kind of like broadened my focus beyond legacy code in the past five, six years or so. But it's, um, yeah, it's just been very fun. So I, I like to think about things at a deep level, and there's a lot of interesting things on the horizon now to play with. So it's pretty yeah. much what I'm up to. Cool. You say you're, you're not looking at legacy code anymore. Is that because you fixed all of the legacy code in your vicinity? No, no, no. I mean, it's, people keep writing it all the time, right? So it's like, mm -hmm. that's impossible. Um, but no, it's not that I'm uh, not dealing with it. It's just basically, I think that my scope has expanded. I'm just looking at some other things also. So yeah. I guess that's the best way to put it. Okay. Well, that leads naturally to my first uh, sort of question. If you were to write the book like today, is there anything about it you'd change? <sighs> Well, you know, it's an interesting thing because I almost feel like the core of the book, the core ideas are kind of like a little bit timeless in a way. And that's why I guess it still continues to sell very well now. Um, but I think it would make more nods to current technology, you know, mm -hmm. sort of like that it kind of like reaches the reader and says, hey, by the way, I know about, you know, this thing that you're dealing with right now. But still, it's like it's this kind of a problem of refactoring and testing, that kind of thing. So it's really more like how do you actually sort of approach the reader, that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot more now that I would actually say about how legacy code happens, because that's been almost like the um, sideline pursuit I've had over the past 10, 15 years. It's kind of like you go around and you're helping people with all these problems and you're kind of like, OK, well, how do we avoid all these things? Right. And Agile has had some answers that have been a number of other things. But understanding the real mechanics of how it happens and really how you can basically you know, avoid them at an organizational and individual level. It's been like a lot of what. I've been thinking about it, and I think I would go and add to the book. You know, mm. That and functional programming, because there wasn't very much at that point. Yeah, yeah. So. well, it seems uh, that seems really interesting, because it, to me it would feel like legacy code is inevitable. It's just when code age, ages, it becomes legacy. Um, mm -hmm. I think also uh, we, we should probably deal with a question that uh, is very popular at this, uh, at this time, very much in the in the media and it's AI and machine learning and what effect that will have on code quality and legacy code in particular. Uh, is yeah. refactoring going to be outdated? Yeah, well, it's an interesting thing about that. So I've been playing around with it a lot recently. And um, I don't know, my, my sense is that we're, we're safe for a little while in a way. I think th there's a couple of different things that kind of go together with this. One is that we've had code generators for ages within software development. And there's always been there have always been people who basically say, you know, at some point we'll just be able to generate the applications and we'll be set, right? Um, but there are always like these interesting things like, you know, it's like, what does the thing do well? How much effort is it to go and actually sort of hone in the th on the thing that you really need? And I guess the other big thing with this too is that basically code is still the representation language, right? Um, we are generating code. We need to understand code well enough to be able to go and work with it and sort of like gauge the correctness of solutions because, you know, it's still, there's, there's like the, the hit and miss thing with AI right now. It'll basically give you something that's good sometimes and other times it doesn't compile or basically it's kind of like off track because it's dealing with the ambiguity of your natural language, right? So I think we've got space, you know, in this. Um, but uh, I think, you know, in a way, prompting is just going to become another form of programming in a way, right? And then we have to kind of figure out, you know, what do we do to go and sort of like make the stable pieces we can generate and then the ones that require more attention. So we'll still need modularity at a very coarse grained level in some way. Those are some thoughts about that, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sort of like a, it'll be a new type of REPL, uh, like chat GPT. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, you yeah. have to coax it and prompt it, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and you have to guide it. Like you have to learn to guide it and say, oh, and I know it's going to trip out up over these things and like, Right. So it becomes just a, yeah, it becomes a programming language, which is a little bit f more frustrating in some sense, but can do more for you, I'm thinking. Yeah. Which is yeah, kind of hard because to Because programming right? isn't frustrating <laughs> yeah. at all. I personally haven't worked much with uh, with Copilot or something like that, but uh, it seems like people were also uh, very into that when it came out. It was like, oh, now we won't have to do this simp these simple things anymore. We can just ask Copilot to write them for us. Mm -hmm. And I mean, especially if you're working in a uh, working a lot with tests that are fairly simple, si uh, simple, or at least 
follow a similar structure to how they usually would, then Copilot might yeah. be more helpful. I don't know. Do you have have you tried Copilot? A little bit, not not as much as some of the more recent things, but um, uh, yeah, no, I think so. I, I think the. The thing is that everything with AI now seems to, well, not everything, but a lot of it right now just turns, turns into this thing of kind of like generate and test in a way. And it's kind of like, so you are given things and then you have to basically, you know, the, it's really on your back to go and basically figure out whether it really is the right thing or not. Right. Um, so there's this degree, there's like this sweet spot, I think, between, yay, I can generate a lot of things. It's kind of like, at what scale do I generate things to go and really see that they really are on target for what I need to do? Um, I use it to generate test cases. I've just been kind of happy with what's produced in many cases. I think if nothing else, you get like um, enhanced ideation. There are certain things that you might not think of and, you know, you sort of like you become better yourself in using it because it sort of like introduces you to more possibilities. And that's nice. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, I've also yeah. seen people using, I think it's called procedural testing or something, more and more where they mm -hmm. generate rate a lot of sample input or whatever. And then they yeah. then they verify against that, I think. Yeah, kind of like fuzzing in a sense. Yeah, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, it's great for that sort of thing. Mm. So yeah. yeah, cool. Thanks. Well, Guess we'll see where it goes, right? And it's kind of funny. I'm supposing that years from now, you or I can take a look back at this and sort of say, ah, oh, those guys, you know, they didn't really quite know, you know. Yeah. But, you know, it's hard to predict the future. <laughs> yeah, when Copilot took over the world tomorrow, or. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what's the date yeah. stamp here? What's today's date? Today's the twentieth or twenty first. Twentieth of March. Date stamp for our opinions here. Talking about testing, uh, your book talks a lot about testing, uh, and it follows sort of this agile alliance, sort of um, a very massive on TDD stuff like that, uh, sort of things. So, um, if if before we jump straight into testing. And uh, how do you characterize a legacy code base? How do you recognize if you're sitting with a legacy code base? Well, I don't think there's any hard line with it, really. I think it's, you know, legacy is a subjective judgment that we make quite often based upon the difficulty and the hard, hardness to understand something that we're working with. Um, traditional definition is this code you got from somebody else, right? And at one point I started throwing around the idea, it's like, well, maybe it's a code without test because the way that you work in code without tests is qualitatively different from when you have the tests to kind of like serve as like a safety net for what you're doing. Right. Um, so yeah, how you, how you know, I mean, it's kind of like, yeah, it's really a subjective judgment. I think the main thing I keep coming back to more and more is that to what degree do you actually understand what you're working on? Right. And if you have trouble understanding it and understanding what's behavior is, then you're really in trouble. Right. So everything mm -hmm. is about, getting that understanding either through writing tests um, or reading, you know, all those different things. And um, yeah, there's, there's really a slippery slope on that. Things can kind of fall apart. That's really an interesting, uh, interesting take because I would, I would normally say that it's the level of confidence that you feel and it's very close to what you're describing. The difference yeah. I think from my perspective would be that you, I would, I, I try really hard not to have people read code because humans mm -hmm. read code very slowly. And so the, <laughs> more, the more of that I can skip, the better. And yeah. good method naming, for instance, and, and uh, like having a good hierarchy of your code is a way to sort of eliminate a lot of the branches, hopefully eliminating a lot of the code. Right. And then, I mean, confidence comes from something else, actually, than understanding it. Like, do I trust that this works, even if I haven't looked at it? Yeah, fair enough. And I, I think, yeah, I think in the book, I kind of like nodded to that a bit because I was talking about this thing of like, um, to what degree, degree you can be surprised by what you find or what the system does, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is a general thing. It's kind of like, you know, when we make systems, it's kind of like there's the general thing that it does. And it's like, it should be pretty much unsurprising, right? So it's kind of like, if you basically find something completely counterintuitive in the code, either behaviorally through a test or just, you know, um, through reading things, um, it's kind of like you might be thinking, well, what else is here, right? It's like, is are things really to the point where they're so irregular that I feel like I'm lost or that I could be kind of tripped up by anything that happens? So fair. I think there's a, um, it is a quality of the code base rather than our understand, understanding. So yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Well, and it's uh, so, yeah, and 
a test is obviously one way to sort of gain some of that confidence. Uh, you also yeah. mentioned in the book, which I absolutely love because I also spend a whole chapter on that in, in my own book, is like leaning on the compiler, as you call it. Like yeah, yeah. the compiler is so powerful. Type systems have gotten so good. Mm-hmm. You can actually gain a lot of confidence if you yeah. know how to work with it correctly. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's it's funny with that too, because I you know, I guess when I've described leaning on the compiler, the the other thing that I talk about a bit is deliberately introducing errors in order to find out more about your code, right? Mm-hmm. Which I basically see as another form of testing. It's just never really quite seen that way. But it's like um it's another lever for gaining understanding about what's going on in the system behaviorally. Yeah, so yeah, definitely. It's good stuff. In in yours is the first definition uh, formulation of TDD I've seen that actually includes make it compile. Uh, because it seems to trip up a lot of people that uh, red could also mean a compile error uh, in the yeah, red green yeah. refactor. No, definitely, and it's funny with that too because I think you know, I don't know. It's kind of like I think the the very initial steps in TDD kind of happened in uh, dynamically typed languages, but you know, definitely you know, Kent and uh, people around him were um, were working in Java, you know, at least at the time that he wrote the first book on this. Um, but yeah. No, it's 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 a piece of it, particularly for compiled languages. What's kind of funny for me is quite often working with people in dynamically typed languages. It's kind of like um, I actually prefer dynamically typed languages in many circumstances, but it's also like there's this thing of like you have way more affordances with compiled languages, d- different ways of interrogating the code base. So it's a trade off, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would uh, I, I'm a little bit unsurprised that you work well in dynamic, la- dynamic languages because it seems like mm-hmm. you have a lot of discipline in writing testing and stuff like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. Whereas <laughs> I find my huge challenge when working with dynamic languages is I don't have a lot of testing discipline, I have a lot of typing discipline. And so I'm very challenged on the confidence level when I'm working in dynamic languages. Yeah. Well, can I tell you a little story about this? Because it's a little story I like to repeat. I put it, think I put it in a blog a long time ago. But um, back when I went to college, um, we had a computer lab, and you'd sit in there, and you'd have your terminal, and you'd work on things. And um, we were basically programming in um, Pascal, right? You know, very early language that way. And I was sitting there and doing my assignment, and everything was going fine. But I looked at the person next to me, and on her terminal, I saw an array subscript out of bounds exception or something kind of like that. And I thought, oh, my God, I've never seen that before, right? And I was sitting, I basically, like, gone through almost all of this introductory course and stuff like that. And then I thought about why I hadn't seen that before. And the thing is, because I taught myself programming in C from the beginning. And then I went to college and started learning Pascal, which had a stronger type system. And I just realized that essentially in C, it's kind of like if you mess up, you're, you're in real serious trouble because there's, like, it's hard to know when you messed up and then basically just get these random crazy errors because you're trouncing over memory and stuff like that. So I think there's this interesting thing about kind of starting out with unforgiving tools to go and sort of build your discipline in a way, right? Um, it's a terrible thing to advocate because it's almost like the thing of going in and saying, you know, go out there and march in the woods barefoot for 12 hours and you'll be a better person, right? But I think there is a piece to that as well, that basically the things which in, cause us to go and sort of like develop discipline sometimes are very useful for us, at least very early in our careers. So yeah. anyway, just a thought. You know? I totally agree. Uh, I, and uh, so from my perspective, I started coding in uh, just a straight notepad, no notepad plus plus, no fancy thing. <laughs> yeah. So I put my parens, the close one when I put the open one manually every time. I've never had a mismatched parenthesis, right? Because yeah. that wouldn't have worked back then. I couldn't have sit, sat there counting them. Um, yeah, no, it's fair, but it's 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 a thing. I think those are things that basically you need to go and sort of like I think develop the discipline at some point in your career. Then you can rely on the other things, and it's like once you get that mindset of, of complete attention and discipline, it's cool because you get able to you're kind of able to go and you know dip into it again and dip into it on a case by case basis when you need it. So it's just another you know tool that you can have. I think that's just my sense mm-hmm. of it. Yeah. So uh, just a side note, actually, a side question. Like, um, hmm. I I have noticed the same thing with the debuggers. I don't use them because from back when I started coding, they, I didn't have one, uh, and so yeah. I do printf debugging always. That's the only thing I do, mm-hmm. and it always works pretty much. Yeah. Like, how do you have that same experience? Like, do you use the yeah? I just never really got. Them? I mean, I did use debuggers prior to hearing about TDD and learning it. Um, then I basically got out of the habit of it. Occasionally, I'll fall into printf, but for the most part, it really is this. Thing of going and doing it with, um, you know, with like tests for the most part. Um, the thing I always ask myself is kind of like a design thing is kind of like, how easy is it for me to go and figure out the thing I want to understand 
And if it isn't very easy, it's kind of like, okay, well, there's something kind of messed up about the design. I need to do something to go and at least give things, get things at the grain where basically I have a good testing affordance to go and actually get the answers I need. So mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah. But then I would expect that the code base is at least as complex as the domain you're modeling. That's my general yeah. sort of rule of thumb. So mm. then some things will be hard questions, right? Yeah, I, I think they, they will be hard questions. The thing that's kind of, it, it comes down to this thing of like, well, huh. I, I think, you know, it's not like we have layers, like traditional layers in software development as much anymore or that we really advocate having them. But I almost like... Um, it seems to me that there are different like query layers within an application, right? So if you do, if you have a good domain model in a sense, then you basically are able to think in terms of the domain and ask questions in terms of the domain. And you might be dealing with an area of like four or five classes, for instance, but you know that you can ask the question at the appropriate level for what you need. And maybe you need to go and jump out to like an end to end thing to go and ask something which encompasses more of the domain and more of what's going on. Um, but you, you get this, um, ability to query at different levels. And the design of the system should support that, right? I mean, at its base level, you know, if we have something which is basically like doing accounting, we're going to have like fundamental computations that will probably be held in like maybe two or three methods that we should be able to understand well enough to go and query those in the test, even if we're not asking the big questions about how all the accounts interact and stuff like that, mm-hmm. right? So it's yeah. this thing of like developing almost like language at all these different levels. And it's not like they're specific layers. It's just kind of like the language is present all through the, the system. I think that's the thing I would kind of say, yeah. you know? Yeah. Oh, I think I, I think I get that. It's, it, but it feels like some things are just inherently very difficult to, to sort of uh, tie uh, the lower out of the system. Some information is sort of embedded deep within it. And it's like dependent on all these sort of other things and, at some point, you know, the complexity is there and you have to deal with it. It's like... Yeah, definitely. And I, th- I think but it's also, yeah. And, and I, I just keep going back to that thing of like, that's, that's a lesson for us is when it's, the complexity is there and it's not easily approachable through an API of some sort. Then I'm kind of like, okay, um, what's wrong here, right? Even if I can't fix it right away, I just basically sort of always take that as a cue for design. Um, one of my favorite talks I ever gave was like in 2007 or 2009, I guess it was. It was called The Deep Synergy of Testability and Good Design. And um, I think about writing more about this and this sort of thing, but it's just, it comes down to that thing that almost everything we can imagine that's painful about testing is an indication of some kind of a design problem. And if you basically address the design problem, then, you know, you get better design, but also better testing affordances. And um, yeah, I just, to me, that's kind of like, it's, it's a beautiful thing because it basically helps us get better at what we do. And um, yeah, so it's kind of like you're able to listen to the system and basically learn more about things through your experience of it. You know? Yeah, and I would have the exact, I would actually have the exact same uh, view of it just with testing instead of, uh, oh, sorry, with typing instead of testing. If I can't type yeah, this correctly, cool. if I need reflection, if I need cast, stuff like that, I haven't designed it correctly. Totally. I, I do like to kind of sidestep the whole thing of like, is dynamic better or static better? I like them both for different reasons. And I think that basically it just comes down to context, you know, what you're working in and, and what, you, what you need, you know. And um, so, yeah, the, that, that whole area is just kind of like, it's, it's cool, but I'm kind of like, I'm not going to come down on one side or another on that. You know, it's mm. just like, it's what you need. Yeah. I mean, you'll, you'll also have an easier time on the internet if you, if you don't uh, sort of piss off either, either camp, so to speak. Yeah, fair enough. Well, it can be fun to piss off on both sides. Yeah, sure, side. sure. <laughs> yeah. That's fun. <laughs> How you get your fun, it's not, the, not recommended. <laughs> yeah. I've been to a lot of uh, organizations and I see, uh, now that we're talking about testing, I see a lot of them are struggling with testing. Like it's, it isn't as prevalent in the industry as I would sort of yeah. want it to be. So if I'm, if, if a person is in one of those organizations, like what's, how do they get started? How do we move out of this rut or what do you recall? Well, you know, I, I kind of like the silent approach a little bit with this too, but I think it's just because, you know, having a background as a consultant, it's like, if you go in and you basically say to people, it's like, hey, you got to do things this way. It's like, they're going to rebel or they're going to be kind of like, who is this person who's basically telling me these things? And, you know, sure, I feel like what I was doing was good before. So, you know, prove it to me, that kind of thing, right? But I think, you know, an interesting thing is like an employee of an organization, 
Um, you just have to do your work and you have to do it very well. And the thing is, if you basically discover that these things help you and chances are they will, cause that's what they do, um, these techniques, then, you know, it isn't very long before people start to recognize, wow, this person's having less trouble doing things. What's going on? And the people that are really interested in getting better will gravitate and learn. Right. And, you know, it's, it's very much like, um, you know, it, sometimes leading is not a very overt act. It's just by going and sort of doing something different and getting people curious enough to go and try things out. The thing that I find tr problematic quite often is that people that are like, you know, I find a better way of doing things in an organization. They try to go and lead and say, we have to do it this way. We have to do it this way. They just create enemies. Right. And, um, you know, it, it's kind of like you have to kind of like keep your passion intact a little bit and just sort of like if, if you enjoy what you're doing and you're making things better, quite often it's going to have some kind of a galvanizing effect inside the organization, right? For a, for a consultant, things are a little bit different because quite often you're on the hook to go and actually change things. And then you have to go and basically sort of like sway people to some degree. And I think a little thing that con I used to do with this is basically try to find the people who are, you know, really curious about things and also the people that would, that other people would listen to right? And convince them, right? Then it becomes kind of viral in a sense. And, you know, it's great when you find a person who's in both of those camps, then, you know, it kind of helps to some degree. But I think the other thing to recognize too, is you're not going to get 100% in many organizations, right? That's just the way things are. People are different. They have different um, views about how they're going to go and handle things. And that's just life, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I'm assuming you have, as a chief architect, you have teams working sort of under you or? Uh, no, I think... Chief architect is kind of like a bit of a moniker in a way. I think I kind of chose that title within the organization in Globond um, just because I want to highlight to my friends outside of the industry or excuse me, outside the organization that the um, that architecture is important. I think after many, many years of Agile, there's been the thing of like architecture just kind of emerges. And I think that the kind of thinking that we do about the macro level of systems is extremely important and that kind of thing. So I do work with different teams across the organization and things like this, you know, various different mm -hmm. client accounts and stuff like that. Um, but it's not really as a direct architect role okay. that way. Right. I think yeah. it was more of a signaling thing on my part, you know, in a way. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I understand. How is, so how is, how are your teams or the teams you work with, how do they work? Like, do they use TDD and, and stuff like that? <laughs> yeah, some do, some don't. The thing is, it really comes down to, um, the type of engagement that's um, that's uh, people are being called in for. It's it's funny because there are many different scenarios, you know, for going and like intervening in an organization and producing value. Um, so yeah, quite often it's it's definitely on the palette of things that that we do. You know, yeah, yeah, right. Well, it's it, and it's super interesting what you're saying before that if you're if you're in an organization as a developer and you're you start using some tool that it really helps you, right? And you're going to keep using it, and somebody else is going to see it. Uh, I've actually met people in the industry who had the opposite experience with with testing, where I would come in because they were on their way away from testing, and I was like, "What? Why are you going? Like, why are you doing that?" Hmm. It's because you can tests can sometimes sometimes hinder sort of this refactoring thing, particularly if they're very structural dependent. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the um, the interesting thing to me is sometimes I I, I feel. I, thought, I think I feel much more comfortable than many people putting some of the tests kind of like in the parking lot for a minute and saying, okay, I'm going to go and change the system and I'm going to basically go ahead and do like a structural refactoring that I know the, the, the tests aren't going to basically cover completely. But then sort of like if I can develop confidence in another way to do that refactoring, then I'll basically run the tests and find out, well, they aren't really working against the methods they need to work against. And I'll basically rewrite tests mm -hmm. that... Um, that will cover the new structure that I have, right? Um, I, I think that there's, we can basically sort of like overly valorize the tests sometimes and think, oh my God, we can't get rid of any tests at all. And then you're in a situation where you're just so scared that you can't change anything, right? And I guess the other thing you're probably getting at is kind of like the level of testing and, you know, how do you actually develop in a way where you aren't sort of like preventing yourself from refactoring, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's, that's definitely an interesting, you know, question, you know, for these things. Yeah, and I've found that a lot of uh, so a lot of the struggles that I I meet with, uh, particularly testing, would be people aren't really experienced with it when they come out of school, and then they mm -hmm. don't have time to learn it. And it's actually not an easy skill. 
especially yeah. because when you talk about testing, most people focus on the the red uh, green refactor or like sort of the mm-hmm. processes around it. Whereas I find that the most painful thing is actually learning about how to stub things correctly. Because if you yeah. learn how to do test stops, then everything just becomes so much easier. Yeah, and I think there's that. I, I think the other thing that's wild for me to go and kind of notice is that I think that in the way that TDD kind of spread across the industry, it's like some people just basically took it to be like, okay, you write one unit test harness for each class of your system and you're good, right? Um, but then like BDD came along and it's kind of like then you're basically covering a bigger area. And particularly when you look at what Kent has done with this and other people, like I like Ian Cooper's take on this as well. It's kind of like you kind of start out growing tests from a particular point and then you're refactoring outward. You're basically decomposing things as they get bigger. So your tests are over here, but they basically cover a larger space. I think that's the key message that kind of needs to get across to people rather than this, you know, one-to-one mapping of um, test classes to, to production classes. I think that's a way where people kind of get themselves, you know, they kind of paint themselves into a corner to some degree. Yeah, and especially when you yeah. start testing like private meta- methods and stuff like that. Like if you're if you yeah. don't stay to the public interface, then like you are just in for a headache when you want to restructure yeah. that code. And, and what's wild about this too is that essentially it's like I think you know Martin Fowler talked about this years ago. It's like we don't have a a good thing now to go and actually mark things as published rather than public, right? So public is a is a code level thing at the class level. A method can be public or not. But it's kind of like you need something which is kind of like this is an interface that we see from the outside world, but not necessarily within this particular area and unit. Of course, it goes and kind of like differs across programming languages. But, um, yeah, that kind of separation is something that's not really kind of like built into languages. So it's not overt and we have to go and make, you know, our sense of like these are the these right here are the public methods that we are holding invariance on as opposed to these other ones. Right. So, mm-hmm. kind yeah, of tough. Yeah, and, and I, I remember having the trouble also when I wanted to write testing code that tested like uh, not quite public to the like API, but public methods. Yeah. Uh, and then they would have to, the testing classes would have to be in the same package because otherwise they weren't visible. But I didn't yeah. want to compile them in the same unit, right? Because I didn't want to mm-hmm. ship my test code. So it yeah. was just a whole trying to design around that well, it took like days to figure out the, the yeah, beautiful. I, I tend to try to convince people to go and actually ship their test code. You know, in with that, just because, well, particularly, I guess for me, I get called in to look at these really horrible situations. And it's kind of like, there's just not, you don't have many other options in terms of actually sort of like easing the entry into going and starting to get control of the code base, short of actually going and shipping them, you know, in parallel that way. Um, so, I mean, and there's reason, there are some valid reasons not to do that. But I think it's still something where it's, uh, if you, if you can have that discussion, and move to doing that. Sometimes that kind of eases the transition into going and building a, a, an easier way of working with a legacy code base. Yeah, I mean, it certainly changes sort of the uh, the whole view on. I wanted to I want to ship the thing that I've tested, but I don't want the tests in the thing that I'm going to ship. So it's sort of like that constant struggle. Yeah, and sometimes that's kind of like a sense of it's like an aesthetic thing. It's kind of like, oh well, these things are different. They shouldn't be in the same place, right? Um, I don't know if I mentioned this in the book, but I do mention it in training quite often. Um, it's kind of like, I think it was Voltaire who basically had this saying that when you translate French to English, it's best is the enemy of good in a way, right? Mm-hmm. So you're sitting there and you're working with somebody and it's kind of like they're saying, you know, wow, you're breaking dependencies using this technique and it makes the code look ugly and you have to kind of like, have you looked at the code, right? I mean, it is kind of ugly, right? You know, that, that kind of thing. It's kind of like some of the things that you do to go and actually start to break dependencies and get tests in place are going to violate some things that you, some preconceptions you might have about good design, but they are there to facilitate basically doing the refactoring to make the design better. So it's, it's cracking the eggs to make the omelet a little bit, you know? I mean, when you say that we have to talk about encapsulation, obviously, yeah, yeah. which you also mentioned in the book that uh, you don't mind breaking encapsulation if it makes testing easier. Well, the thing is that, you know, when you say it that way, and I'm not sure exactly how I said it, but that simplification is good. But it's like, it's not saying, hey, I'm a fan of breaking encapsulation, but selectively, in particular places to go and give you the affordance to go and test things, right? And, you know, you do it reluctantly, but you're doing it in such a way that, you know, when you're encapsulating, you should be thinking about what it is you want to encapsulate, right? So to go and break encapsulation at the edge of a new sphere 
that you want to go and basically hold as your place of encapsulation is okay because you're creating like a new boundary around something of value. So it's a matter of finding the things of value that are there and saying, where do I want to basically sort of like be outside of that to test? And you might have to break at those edges in order to go and start to form this thing, you know, that, you know, form this, this layer around the, um, the value that you're trying to go and sort of preserve through tests. So yeah, it's that kind of thing. It's, it's, I, I tend to think rather visually. So, of course, I'm using my hands doing this kind of thing. But it, <laughs> when you think about it, in a lot of systems, it's like they're broken down in these pieces in particular ways, in particular shapes. And it's like sometimes you're looking at them and you're like, well, these three things can be part of a bigger thing. So it's up to me to go and build that bigger thing around those things, right? And other times you have a thing which has several responsibilities and when you break it apart, and then you have a different task, which is going to be, how do I actually go and support this from the outside with tests to be able to break it apart, right? If I'm working with something that's like legacy co code, I would, I would sort of um, attempt to limit the, the tendency of local changes to have global effects, right? That's sort of what I'm scared yeah, of. Totally. That's really the, the issue with, with legacy code, is mm -hmm. that effects propagate in a, in a non-local way. And humans yeah. don't, can't seem to get that into their heads. We're used to mm -hmm. local, local. So... I would, I would re often I would try to encapsulate things harder because that helps to sort of limit all of these uh, effects, right? They can't escape if you encapsulate in a in a very hardcore way, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And and I and I noticed that you mentioned also the three the three ways that co that uh, effects can can propagate, and it's like exposing data, obviously constructors uh, and uh, passing arguments or mutating it directly. Yeah. So then I would, uh, my approach would be, sort of, or my intuition would be to sort of limit the, the, the effect of the things. But then you're saying that you would, you would have the test to sort of alert you at least if something changes non-locally, right? That's what the test should be there to do. Um, well, I, I think I always look at the test as basically a way of understanding the thing, right? And it's kind of like if the thing changes in a way that you didn't really anticipate, then basically the test is going to go and break. So... Mm. Um, I, I think for me, it's really the the work leading up to writing the test is about going and building the isolation so that the effects don't propagate necessarily, right? Or at least you have a barrier to go and basically make sure that they don't propagate, right? So if you basically are accessing a singleton inside of a class, it's like, yeah, I want to basically sort of like find a way to go and actually inject that value through the constructor rather than basically go and, you know, mutate the singleton directly within the class, right? Um and so you slowly go and start to build these firewalls against effects propagating when you're doing this. But a lot of these tend to be bigger issues in the architecture, you know, so it's kind of like it takes a while to go and actually start to root those things out. And you have to go and sort of assess the value of doing that when you actually have the test there to go and tell you about yeah. whether these side effects actually occur in a bad way. I think yeah. it's, it's a very problematic thing because I think one of the things that in legacy code that's tough is that basically code grows in a particular way. And it's like if you were if you have like lots of global access all across the system, you're not going to be able to fix that in your lifetime necessarily, right? But you should be able to go and at least build in the sensing through tests to go and understand, you know, where the tripwires are. If something goes wrong, you want to know about it immediately, right? So the code is less understandable by reading it, but then the tests are able to go and give you the feedback that you can't get by reading it because things have gotten gummed up in a particularly bad way. So there, there is this, this question of legacy code bases about how, how far is reasonable to go in terms of your plans for how good it's going to go and get. Yeah, please, uh, like, what is it? What is reasonable? Like, how, how much time should you invest in fixing legacy code or avoiding it? Well, here's the thing that I think is really a, a very, very critical thing. You know about, like, the 80-20 rule, right? Like, you know, it's like 80% of... You know, the work happens in the last 20% of the project and all these different things. It's part of something called the Pareto principle, right? And there are a lot of natural systems that are this way where essentially, you know, like 20% of the code has higher value than the other 80%, for, for instance, stuff like that. If you do a distribution of method sizes in a project, you'll find that, you know, it's kind of like a lot of the methods tend to be really small, but then you have maybe 20% that tend to be outsized in size and stuff, right? So it's a mathematical thing that happens as a side effect of incremental growth in systems um, or incremental value seeking. Um, so the thing I'm always looking at with the system is like, okay, well, what are the high value areas, right? And my notion of value is a little bit generalized. It's kind of like, 
it's not just what the business thinks is important, but it's also like, what are you changing frequently right now, for instance? What are the things that, we, what are the areas that basically are more bug prone? So it's not really value as much as kind of like the highly active areas of the system, the areas where basically you have some criticality, right? And so you look at those and you're kind of like, okay, what can I do to go and actually bring these points into stability? And the thing that's interesting is that the 80-20 rule applies to commits also, right? There's like about, there's many, many files in your system that you'll probably never change again, right? And there's others where basically you have clusters of changes and that's going to change over time in the system. But if you're aware of those dynamics, then you basically know where to concentrate your effort. And I think that's the thing that's kind of important with this is like, you, you can look at a particular area and recognize it's a very stable area of code. It's, it's kind of messed up in the way it's structured and stuff like that, but you're not, not going to get a return benefit for investing in that beyond a certain point. It's like you want to stabilize it, understand with tests what's possible within that particular area of code, but you don't want to kind of like bolster it up in a way that basically makes it um, a, a place which is extremely easy to go and work in because you're not going to get the value back from this. So I think having a very... Um, comprehensive uh, conversation, you know, in the team and within the organization about where these hotspots are and where these value centers are within the system and understanding what you're going to concentrate on, you know, is very important. And a lot of this is really kind of outlined by Eric Evans, like in domain driven design. So you have like the notion of bounded context and these different things. And he mentions with like anti corruption layer and all these different, you know, patterns um, that you're really, it's really about going and finding these high value areas and sort of like working on that. And I think that's that's the thing. It's not an easy thing necessarily, but I think the thing we need to get, recognize is that you know, chain or uh, value is not uniformly distributed across systems. It simply isn't, and we should behave differently in different areas of the system because of that. Yeah, I I know that uh, uh, hotspot detection is a major part of uh, the the code quality tool code scene. Um, yeah, like have you do you use tools like that? Well, I've used it a bit. I'm actually on the advisory board of Code Scene, right? Oh. Um, so it's yeah, it's uh, I know Adam Tornhill from way back when he wrote his first book, and a great guy. And um, no, I, I really I like that because I think the the interesting thing I remember seeing years ago that it's kind of like there's a lot of information in our um, in our repositories that we just don't really think about, and he just sort of launched in there and started going and and digging and developing tooling around that sort of thing. So I think that's extremely extremely valuable. I think it's one of those things where you can either kind of like work on things without much awareness or you can basically build awareness. And a lot of this tooling goes and gives you the ability to go and find hotspots, but also do things like, um, like, uh, you know, planning, you know, like, oh, if a person's going to leave, what it has to impact the code base and various different things like that that are really good for the sustainability of systems. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's like Sonora Cube is good too. There's lots of tooling out there that, that basically supports this kind of an effort. And that's good. How how should an organization sort of tackle this problem? How much time should they invest? Like what policies should they put in place to get some of their legacy code down? Yeah, that's an interesting thing. So I think it really comes down to that kind of value analysis I was talking about a little bit earlier, right? And just sort of figuring out, and there's things like application portfolio analysis and all these different things that people tend to do. But you need to figure out what's critical. And uh, a term I use quite often is rules of engagement. It's kind of like if you... If you figure out where the very critical areas of the system are, you might say, well, people can't just go and commit against these things. You need pull requests with particular people. They need to go and actually review them. And you do this in order to go and sort of like sort of build up stability in those particular areas. And other areas, it might be just, well, anybody can go and sort of commit against this. And that's okay because it's low you know, criticality. But getting people to see that value across the organization is really the first step, that kind of thing. Um, the secondary thing is kind of like figuring out whether you're really organized in a way to go and do these things well, right? Um, a lot of times historical th- reasons lead us to going and having like different fault lines and organizations. We're basically separated in different teams that end up producing strange Conway's law effects that are kind of like there. Um, I am a fan of the team topologies work. I think it's really kind of good. I think if I had any little criticism at all, it's kind of like it. Um, it arrives at a very normative, it arrives at a very like, this is the way you should organize. And that's good because it is, it does seem to cover a lot, but I always tend to want people to go and think about, um, you know, what are the forces that lead you into trouble and how can you actually sort of like, you know, sort of like move them in a way where basically the problem disappears in some sense. Um, so I think those are kind of like macro level things. And beyond that, 
it's like building a culture of refactoring. And it's like, um, I think, you know, to the degree that basically the refactorings are talked about in retros, um, that basically people work on refactorings together, um, that people can actually sort of speak up when they think something's bad, right? I think it's really the, the important thing. It just really comes down to basically raising awareness within teams. And, um, and I think also kind of like um, connecting with the de- connect, having the developers connect their pain with a solution, right? Um, it's always been troubling to me to find developers that are basically doing very painful things. And they don't think about it as pain. They think about it as normal, right? And then you can show them how they can make their environment a little bit better. And then they're kind of like, oh, wow, I have, I have something I can do here, which is kind of powerful. And just, I know this is a long answer, but the whole 80 20 thing is really so valuable there, right? Because essentially it's like, if you make a little area of the system better and you're there because, you know, you're called in to fix something, um, if that's an area where you get lots and lots of change, you know, you're basically going to make things a little bit better. And then the next person's going to get that benefit. Um, the areas where this, where you do this, that are high um, criticality, um, are going to get a lot of change. And then the things that you do to make things better are going to basically give you almost immediate return you know, on these mm-hmm. things. Maybe other areas of the system are just never, never hit in the sense that you never have to go and add testing because somebody's ever changing them. But it's not like you look at a, a 10,000 file code base and say, oh my God, we're doomed because we'll never get tests for that 10,000 files. There's a, there's a certain nugget of the system that basically your set of nuggets of the system that once you start getting, um, get making a headway, then you start feeling the benefits. And that's a very useful thing to get across. You have this thing in, in the book, when you have to make a change of some very complex part of the system, people will sit down and try to understand it because it feels suspiciously like work, I think you say in the book, which is yeah, yeah, which I thought was a like very humorous uh, way of saying it. I sort of yeah. try to hack into that and give them something else that is actually valuable, like breaking up methods. And it's easy. Mm-hmm. Also, they can do it without their brain, right? That's sort of the whenever yeah, you yeah. your eyes glass over, have people do something sort of meaningful with that time, because they can't tackle problems if they're cognitively exhausted, so to speak, like have them do something with their hands, right? Instead. Totally. Just one little plug for something else. There's a small thing I mentioned in the book that I wish I'd really written about more. Every time I talk to people, I sort of offer them as a possibility of scratch refactoring, which is kind of like take the code, throw it into a file, like a, just a, a straight, you know, text file, as opposed to like your programming language file. So you don't have all the markup about, you know, possible errors and stuff like that. And just start renaming things and moving things around and don't worry about breaking things because you're never going to check it in. And that basically is like, it's so counter to our intuition as developers because we're always so cautious about how we change things. But when you know you're not going to check in things, just by going and being kind of hands-on, you start to go and gain much more insight into the thing that you're working in. Even if you can't actually sort of like fix things right away, at least you get a sense of where the danger zones are and stuff like that. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and well, I love the scratch refactoring thing. Also, I noted it in my in my notes because it's very similar to what I would just call the all of the refactoring that I do, basically. Except I also mm-hmm. check it in and I take smaller steps and and a little bit of that extra things. But it's very much the thing that if you try to understand it, if you start with this, if you think about it too too big, it it won't you won't go anywhere with it, right? You'll just be stuck, yeah. sort of paralyzed yeah. for opportunity. Yeah. So it's getting past fears, taking the first step. You know, that's why it goes. And trying something out and like just, yeah, doing it. As you also say, like start writing uh, like a single test or something. If you have something like, you can start improving the quality fairly quickly, just a little bit. Yeah. And that's like, to me, writing a test is asking a question of the code base. And if you're curious about stuff, and you should be because you're working on it, you know, yeah. write those tests. I think uh, we don't have too much more time. Is there, uh, is there something you want to sort of... Uh, Clock here before we ended up? Not necessarily. I think the, the thing is, it seems like the AI stuff is going to change things a lot in the short term. And that's, you know, maybe we look back at this and say, oh, well, we, we thought it was, but it really didn't. But I think the bet right now is that it's going to change a bunch of different things. But I think the key thing is that when you're working in legacy systems, it's kind of like you get a real opportunity to learn more about how design works in a way. And um, so there is something exciting about doing that. You get to learn more about design. And um, I think that a lot of the things that we basically know about design are things that are going to be still very important as we move forward in the industry. It's really kind of hard for me to imagine a situation where uh, for all development, 
we get to the point where we don't have to think about cohesion and coupling and all these different things. We might have to think about them at a different level, but so much of learning about these things is immersing yourself in it. And Legacy Code is a place to learn. And that's the way I kind of look at it. Spot on. I totally agree. Cool. Thank you very much, Michael, for sitting down with me. It's, uh, it's been super fun. Yeah, it has. It's fun. Thanks for interviewing. Subscribe to the GoTo YouTube channel now and join the experts in person or online at any upcoming GoTo conference using the promo code BOOKCLUB. Visit gotopia.tech to learn more.